uh, maybe good afternoon to some of you online. Uh, welcome all for this uh, second day of the uh, Risk Forum. It's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, this morning. It is also my great pleasure to welcome uh, Irene Monasterolo, uh, who will give us uh, uh, the first keynote of the, of the morning uh, to, to take the floor. Uh, Irene is a professor of finance uh, with uh, EDEC, if I'm correct. Uh, and she was previously uh, in a number of institutions, most recently in Vienna. Um, she visited a number of other universities in Boston and, and, and other places. Uh, she's also very well known for uh, being one of the, of the leaders in, uh, in the field of uh, developing uh, stress testing for climate. Uh, so, I mean, I think we, uh, a lot of us, uh, starting with me, are very delighted to be here today to, uh, to, hear, your, to hear your speech, Irene. If you don't mind, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me here today. It's a great pleasure to be, to be here. And uh, today, I'm presenting a, a very recent research. So the working paper was uh, published two days ago. And uh, while previous analysis we did uh, about climate stress test were mostly about transition risk, today we will be talking about asset level climate physical risk assessment. And we will be talking about uh, uh, physical risk assessment uh, in the context of cascading uh, risk and financial losses. We will explain more about it. Um, this is joint work uh, with uh, Giacomo Bressan and Anja Juranovic from uh, Vienna University of Economics and Business and Stefano Battiston from University of Zurich and University of Venice. And the work has been uh, done within the premises of the uh, H2020 European project Cascades. What are the challenges that we face when we talk about climate physical risk assessment? Uh, well, mm, climate physical risk assessment intends as uh, both climate-led hazards, so acute risk of climate change, and long-run climate impacts, so chronic impacts of climate change, received so far less attention than uh, uh, transition risk and some of the reasons uh, among the reasons there are several challenges uh, related to that on the one hand the first challenge relates and knowledge gaps relate to uh, physical asset data so when we talk about uh, um, assets and mean plants productive plants like industrial uh, plants or real estate data in this context are mostly when we talk about geolocalized data they are mostly proprietary, uh, they are not standardized, uh, and thus there is a uh, need to consolidate financial, extra-financial, and climate information. The second challenge is about scenarios. Cur um, current analysis on physical risk either <coughs> focused on acute or chronic risk scenarios. But in a recent paper that we published uh, with Nicola Ranger and Olivier Mahul for the World Bank, we showed why this could lead to a, a misestimation of risk and opportunities for, uh, for finance. Another point is about, uh, another challenge is about the pricing of uh, uh, climate physical risk. There is contrasting evidence. Some studies uh, find that there is uh, some um, form of pricing others not, uh, different across different type of uh, financial contracts, but mostly they focus on past hazards. But we know that the future will be very different, so we need to work with scenarios, and the IPCC, last IPCC report was quite clear about the non-linearity of impacts and potential tipping points. Also, in most cases, the pricing that uh, effect that we find so far is low. And we should ask ourselves whether this will be enough for edging strategies or adjustment in investment decision. The last challenge is that so far, the results that we obtain, for instance, from macroeconomic models of financial assessment of physical risk, either in particular when we consider only chronic risk, show small shocks 
And this is the, and the reason is, of course, the long time horizon, but also the fact that these analyses pro, uh, don't consider heterogeneity of asset exposure to climate risk. And they don't consider uh, firm's business lines composition. Let's make an example of the challenge. So when we, uh, data. Most databases of disaster losses either provide uh, long-term series like MDAT, but of aggregate socioeconomic losses, I mean losses in monetary values on GDP. Others, newest one like Desinventor, uh, provide disaggregate losses by type of item at, in the, at the county level, but these are only available for limited number of years and limited number, limited number of countries. So actually, we cannot really do um, uh, much with that. There is also very limited consistency across physical risk scores uh, provided by different uh, private data providers and uh, uh, research studies. In particular, um, there is low correlation between model basis approach, like the one used by South Pole, Carbon for Finance, and the test well approaches. And this is due to different assumptions, model use or document use for test well analysis. So there is uh, low space for comparability and integration. Last but not least, the poor access to asset level information compelled us to use so far uh, sector aggregation also at the and higher aggregation at the geographical level. And this may cause an underestimation of the of risk, but most importantly, may lead to an imperfect understanding of what drives, which asset, which business line drives the larger adjustment, largest adjustment in financial valuation. So in this, this paper in a nutshell is the, addresses the following knowledge gaps. So far, climate physical risk assessment has neglected asset level data when we're um, talking about geolocalization, type of economic activity, and technology of the plant. And this can lead to a large estimation errors, for instance, in terms of losses, and potentially not coherent investment decisions. Where asset level uh, is available, there are um, coherent, uh, serious consolidation issues. And thus, so far, an established methodology to connect climate physical risk to financial evaluation is not available yet. This paper contributes to fill this gap. We provide the first comprehensive science-based and transparent methodology to connect asset level data, geolocalized data by uh, activity and technology type with firm's revenues, economic dynamics, and financial valuation and risk assessment for a portfolio of securities. The methodology is flexible, can be tailored to different type of financial contracts, different type of assets and countries. In our approach, the risk results from the interplay of the impact of chronic shocks on sectors and, uh, in a, that are elaborated in a macroeconomic uh, model, the impact of acute shocks on geolocalized assets elaborated with probabilistic risk assessment, and from firms' revenues from assets that have different geolocalization, uh, technology, activity, and thus contribute to different firms' business lines. We apply the analysis to, um, in the context of cascading climate risk. What do we mean with cascading climate risk? So far, we consider mostly the impact of climate change within the country borders, in particular when we talk about physical risk. But climate-related hazards that may, may hit assets like industrial plants locate, uh, can be located in very different areas from the headquarters of the firm that own the plants, but also from the uh, headquarters of the uh, investor who, has, who holds, for instance, the um, financial contracts issued by the firm, like stocks or bonds. So climate-related hazards eating specific assets in faraway countries and areas can increase the firm's probability of default. And adjustment in PDEs can lead to a decrease in the expected value of the financial contract and a potential negative shock for the portfolio 
of the investor who holds it. Moreover, if the investor is an intermediary issuing itself financial instruments, we can have implica potential implications for contagion and systemic risk. Our application today focuses on uh, the case study, which is uh, Mexico, uh, which is interesting for several reasons. First of all, it's highly interconnected in the uh, global economic value chain, and uh, it's uh, hit by several types of hazards. What we are focusing here today is on a hazard, a type of hazard, so uh, tropical cyclones, hurricanes, that are not the largest type of shock that hits the country, but is uh, one shock that um, has uh, localized high impacts. So, because of course it would have been uh, easy if we took like hurricanes in the Caribbean. Well, that's, uh, we expect very large uh, shocks. But in most countries, uh, we um, expect to have um, few, but uh, very disruptive events. So this is the case we analyze here. We have 177 firms, which are uh, both Mexican and internationally owned, with 1,820 assets geolocalized in Mexico. Uh, we, have, we consider the exposure of all types of European investors to those firms uh, via 17,000 uh, uh, equity holdings for uh, 290 billions. And we focus on, for acute risk on tropical cyclones, and for chronic risk on a set of uh, representative concentration pathways and uh, socioeconomic share pathways according to the IPCC. And the financial valuation is applied at uh, 2000. This is, I know that this is small, but just to give you an idea of the meteorological framework. We start by developing uh, a database model for data collection, and with data we consider financial, extra-financial, and climate information, so asset type, location, capacity, residual life, prices, and so on, from different uh, data providers. We reconstruct the global firm's ownership chain, we harmonize and clean data, and we deal with missing values. Then, we use this information to uh, uh, populate the um, plant level probabilistic disaster risk assessment for tropical cyclones using uh, climada tracks and tracks adjusted for future um, climate scenarios. The hazards are area specific and um, are captured, the impact of the hazards on the asset is captured by damage function considering different return periods, up to 250. Then we match um, plant level information with the sector classification of economic activity of a macroeconomic model where we uh, get shock, uh, the, um, where sectors are shocked with chronic uh, impacts. And the impacts are expressed as a ratio between the baseline of output in the absence of um, chronic risk and with chronic risk. Then we go to the adjustment in climate financial, uh, so with the assessment of climate financial impacts, consolidating uh, shocks, uh, the level of assets, business lines, firms, and then we move to the investor when we adjust the financial valuation, um, and in particular, we develop a um, climate uh, dividend discount model in three stages where we adjust for the acute and chronic shock the long run uh, growth rate of the firm. And then we uh, move to the adjustment of the expected shortfall of an investor. Important in this analysis uh, is the uh, step of disaggregation of revenue shares by business lines. Here you have two examples on the right uh, I know that it's small, but basically what we want to say here is that we consider the company as a portfolio of business lines and geographically distributed assets. So we collect and harmonize information on uh, geolocalized assets by business lines and products, financial information, climate relevant information, and revenue shares. Now, this work, okay, you can think, and some of you are already implementing uh, machine learning models and uh, um, NLP processes. It can be done, 
but manual work cannot be substituted. You can, uh, why? Because when you look at revenue shares, the structure of the reports of firms, so how firms report revenue shares from different uh, lines of activities is very different. And thus, this divergent structure of individual companies' reports and their complexity required actually a lot of manual work first to train the algorithm there. We consider data which are mostly available, so from uh, standard uh, data providers, and uh, what we did was trying to get the best out of them and uh, to show what we can do with uh, uh, available information when you uh, actually uh, tr uh, harmonize them. For the climate physical risk, we consider, um, we, we use uh, um, metro um, the methodology and data from Climada, uh, IPCC reports and scenarios and the literature. In this analysis, we, uh, what I'm showing now, it's a snapshot on a specific, uh, uh, on a series of uh, economic activities and sectors in Mexico. So we consider in particular um, physical assets related to uh, energy and uh, electricity and commercial real estate. These are our geolocalized assets in Mexico uh, by type of uh, facility and capacity. Okay, second step is the asset level probabilistic risk assessment. And here we have uh, um, the picture shows the workflow moving from the bottom to the top. So from the Mm, bottom pane, we have the specially explicit exposure, so with geolocalized assets which are referenced by latitude and longitude, different type of plants, uh, and uh, financial and non-financial variables such as value, but also capacity, residual life, and all. The second uh, layer, uh, the second pane, represents the historical and synthetic hurricane tracks that we obtained from Climada. Of course, other types of uh, hazards could be considered, but Climada allowed us only to focus on this one. And the third step, the third pay, is uh, assess the, in, looks at the uh, expected annual impacts on assets. So we assess the direct damages computed at different return periods and on average across all the uh, return periods and scenarios considered. Here shortly, the, uh, the uh, tracks from, for tropical cyclones we are obtained from the International Best Track Archive for, for uh, climate stewardship for uh, Mexico. Uh, we calibrate a damage function based on a manual to translate wind speed into stock, uh, shock on capital stock, and we calibrate it uh, using uh, um, results of a paper we published last year on Journal Banking and Finance, Duns et al. on compound risk. We calculate the expected annual impact, so the impacts uh, of the uh, hazards weighted uh, by, their frequency, the, by the frequencies of events, like uh, EAI. And then we get to the, uh, we fit this information into a three-stage climate discount, uh, dividend discount model, and uh, where, um, to adjust the valuation of, uh, of the equity, of the firm, where D is the, our dividends, R is the discount rate, and GL, which is what matters the most for us in this analysis, is the long-run growth rate of dividends. Uh, the three blocks represent the three stages, as in Sharpie et al. So we have a growth phase, transition phase, which is the second, and a mature phase that in the original formulation uh, sets that the company reaches an equilibrium Earning growth uh, and earning growth reaches a level that can be sustained in the long term. Well, this is the step from the second to the third period, from T2 to T3, is what we shock here with the results of the chronic impacts and the acute impacts. How this enters in, uh, how these impacts enter into uh, G, um, the adjustment in GL? So, we have, uh, this depends from the chronic shocks on sectors of economic activities, which are elaborated uh, into a macroeconomic model. Uh, in this uh, analysis, we use the ICA, 
ICES, CG model, but other type of macroeconomic models uh, can be used. And this is described by um, um, OII, uh, where uh, O is the output trajectory for business line I, so uh, at the level of individual business lines. Here, the business line contain the composition of the assets that we recollected into the specific business, the reference business line. And uh, capital I is the climate scenario. Um, the capital, uh, the, um, uh, so we calculate the chronic shocks as difference in output from um, no climate impact, so the business, so the baseline B, to climate, uh, to the output condition to the climate scenario. A ratio smaller than one implies a negative impact from chronic shocks. Then the acute shocks enter via the delta. So the delta um, larger than one uh, shows that companies are likely to experience higher costs from the destruction of assets from uh, hazard and chronic impact in the long run. So the impact of both shocks then is weighted by the revenue share of the relevant business line, which is SI uh, for all K firms. Why this weighting? Because if the asset is largely exposed to climate uh, risk, but has li very limited contribution to the firm revenues, then the financial relevance of the shock is, of course, uh, much lower. And here we get to some results. So, what we see here, what we want to focus here on the difference between the um, average impacts, which is the first column, and uh, the uh, column, the last, co last two columns that actually consider um, also acute shocks and uh, at asset level and larger return periods. So what we see is that when we move from the average shock across scenarios, and not considering asset level shock information to scenarios that consider acute shocks on assets and higher return periods, the shock on the equity uh, valuation and equity value of the firm increases considerably and could reach also higher peaks of 13% uh, for um, RP 2050. Um, also, the expected shortfall of our investor, we actually adjust and we could get uh, minus quite 12% uh, for uh, return period of 250. So this in fact shows that considering asset level information and shocks makes the financial valuation a bit different. And here we can see it even better. This slide shows the heterogeneity of assets location and the uh, deviation from the average shock, which is represented by the diagonal. So the more the uh, assets are, these are the individual um, assets of the firms, are located uh, far away from the diagonal, the more uh, are impacted by hazards and uh, the larger is the shock. And the two um, graphs represent different uh, chronic scenarios. So on the left, we have uh, SSP2 RCP6. Uh, and on the right, we have a more extreme uh, SSP5 RCP4.5. Then what we see here is that uh, the heterogeneity of climate impacts is really visible by business lines and across scenarios. So here we have box plots uh, where on the x-axis we have the different type of scenarios considered and each box plot represents the distribution of the value of delta which is the uh, shock on growth of firms um, across business lines. So, and uh, what we can see here is that moving from the average shock on the top to uh, acute and higher Mm, a return period shocks on assets in the second box actually changes the delta considerably. And then the last box 
shows actually the impact on the business lines in the uh, macroeconomic uh, model. And what we see here is that the impact, this also leads us to understand why the impacts are not so big, because there are some sectors that will have positive uh, impact from uh, climate change, for instance, reconstru for reconstruction and so on. And this is the last result. So what we see here is that asset location and asset type matter in explaining uh, equity shocks and the dynamics. Let's take similar firm, so power plant, firms with power plants, but with different composition of business lines and assets. So on the left, you can see the, um, the uh, actually um, company with different business lines that include uh, also uh, hydro and uh, gas, and a specific geolocalization of assets. On the right, we can see uh, also power plant, but with a different composition and different geolocalization of assets. Now, what we see on the right is that mm, given the location and the asset type, we have a negative shock on the equity value of the firm, both under the average, which is the um, 3D graph on the top left, and under the acute shock at RCP 250, which is the uh, second pane on the, um, on the right. Moving instead on the right, we can see a different trend for this company where the, um, we have an initial shock and then a recovery. Overall, what we see here is that the net effect on the firm uh, equity valuation depends on the firm's business line composition and on the exposure of the type of assets. This is why asset level information matters. And here a conclusion, so what we show is that it's possible to consistently connect financial and non-financial information on companies, business lines and assets, and to their equity holdings for climate risk assessment. Um, the CD, uh, DDM model that we developed is able to capture the impact of physical risk on equity valuation across scenarios of chronic and um, acute shocks. What we see is that, uh, this is of course preliminary results, so this is the first time I'm presenting this uh, analysis, is that the cascading climate physical risk can be relevant for European investors and that heterogeneity across assets matters both for firms and uh, financial, uh, for, uh, for risk assessment for firms and investors. Thank you. Um, many thanks, Irene. Uh, I think we, if I'm turning to Marie, do, do we have five minutes for questions? Okay. Uh, so we have, we have a f some time for questions uh, in the audience and also online. Uh, they will be posted on, on my tablet. I see one over there. Hello. Thank you very much. So thanks, thanks a lot, really, uh, Irene. Very inspiring and very rich. <laughs> so we probably need to read the paper now. Um, I have a question on related to the time horizons that you are playing with. So can you discuss a little bit the, um, uh, so not the climate system which evolves and a lot of things that you are taking into account, especially the duality uh, chronic and and, um, mm -hmm. and acute shocks. But can you discuss the kind of um, uh, validity or realisticness of, of this type of approach with time mm -hmm. as uh, the more changes will come in uh, several decades probably from now, but the, uh, probably the, the economic system and the firms themselves will have changed by then. So can you discuss this? how can we maybe add an, a layer of uh, adaptability of, of, of companies or uh, anticipations, etc., cetera, to, to make this maybe more a bit more even uh, dynamic. Thanks a lot. May I go? Yes, please. Thank you. This is a, 
<laughs> very uh, good question that allows me to clarify also some of the contributions uh, that I mean, uh, of the paper that maybe I was not able to clearly explain in, uh, in this uh, uh, fast walk. So actually, the time uh, horizon is uh, um, um, from 2020 to 2050. And this is also a reason why you might not uh, see the very large shocks which are expected to occur from chronic risk mostly in the second half of the century, but we thought that this is a bit more realistic for financial valuation and investors who maybe already struggle to go beyond the five years and uh, 2050, okay, we have the net zero targets by 2050, and beyond that, I mean, it's a bit, uh, <laughs> it starts to be uh, more challenging to be considered. So the dynamics uh, and the evolution of the economy are captured by the dynamics of the macroeconomic model. So we let the macroeconomic model run from current time when the evaluation, the financial evaluation is conducted until 2050. So of course, depending on the assumption of the model, and this can be, uh, but the, the beauty of this approach is that it can be applied with different macroeconomic models. And also when I say different, also very, very different approaches. Here we uh, used the CGE by uh, Bosello and others, but we are we have also applied this analysis with the, the um, stock, stock for consistent agent-based model that I developed with, um, in working with, uh, with some uh, colleagues. So very different models that provide uh, different sectoral dynamics. The dynamics of the model, how this, uh, the future risk of climate change and evolution are taken into account through the scenarios. And they are calculated at every five years time steps. Okay, I saw two other questions. Marie, you had one and someone just... Uh Thanks, Irene, for a very nice talk. I, I had a question about the, the timing as well, because it looks like you have a transitory phase where you do not account for the shock. So I was wondering if you did a sensitivity analysis to this time period. Between T1 and T2, basically the firms are not affected, right? So the, the growth rate impact is after T2. So I was wondering what the sensitivity of your results may be to T2. And, uh, and another question also is, if I understand correctly, there are no supply chain relationships, right, in, in your model. So I was wondering, could that be also, because you did a lot of work on that as well, to combine the two, right? Because once you have this physical impact at the plant level, then they, they could also cascade through other firms. Is it something you could uh, develop? What, what's your view? Yes, thank you for the very <laughs> relevant questions as well. So. Um, why we don't focus on T1? Simply by construction, we decided to focus because the model is given like this, and uh, uh, usually the, uh, what we are interested in are in the long, um, long term uh, growth dynamics of the firm, and this is what is captured from uh, moving from T2 to T3. Uh, that's simply by that. But yeah, we will do this. Yeah, that's good. Uh, that's good. Um, good point. We are also applying it with uh, different approaches, so discounted cash flow. So we will, uh, in that case, it might be easier. And for uh, yeah, uh, I mean across supply chains, we expect, of course, the shock to be amplified. Uh, look at what's happening right now, even just uh, with adjustment in uh, energy prices uh, and without disaster. So yeah, of course, this could be a very relevant. Uh, uh, extension, and uh, yeah, we we'll, uh, we are thinking about this. And uh, however, in that regard, there is also a decision, a strategic decision that you have to take because uh, uh, in order, when you consider different supply chains, different assets, and different sectors, then doing the validation and uh, on uh, statistical validation to understand what really drives the shock, the adjustment on the evaluation becomes much more challenging because of complexity. So there are some uh, considerations that one, one may want to, to make. But of course, this is uh, I mean, the most relevant application to cascading risk. 
Yes, and we had one question, which perhaps will be the last one. Thank you, Rene, for, for the, the great uh, paper. So I have a question regarding this adjustment that you do. So you adjust valuation based on your, on your model. But in doing that, if I understood correctly, you make the assumptions that investors did not yet price in any of these risks. Okay. So I understand that maybe they, don't, they didn't uh, price in fully these risks because they are difficult to compute, but it may also be that they already started pricing in some of the risk. I mean, we have evidence that, for instance, real estate, the price of real estate is influenced also by future of exposure to physical risk uh, from climate change. So my question is, have, have you thought about maybe estimating, trying to estimate how much of this risk is already priced in uh, currently so that you can maybe correct uh, Thank you. Yes, this is what we are working at. However, in particular for uh, US and Mexico, you have, uh, uh, an, or let's say even more for the US, which is uh, the, uh, the area for which we have most data, uh, there are contrasting analysis on pricing of shocks on real estate. And uh, an important point there is represented by the state guarantee. On that works as a kind of insurance, so actually that leads you to buy uh, houses even on uh, on uh, coastal areas which are expo exposed to hurricanes. So before uh, doing, uh, uh, of course, what you are, uh, what you propose is important, and this is what we are doing. But I would add that there are also other variables that should be considered and have not been included in a current. Uh, analysis of pricing. And the first is the role of uh, government policies, which was shown already by um, Karolin Kowski in Resource for the Future 2014. So this is a lot of work to do <laughs> so on this side, I think. Many thanks, uh, Irene. I, I think we are running out of time. We are already one quarter of an hour <laughs> late. But if you, if you can uh, please take the seat and, and it is my pleasure to uh, welcome Laurent uh, to chair this, uh, this uh, round table. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Jean. Uh, I would like to thank also Marie Brière and Christian Gourayero for having me. So my name is Laurent Claire. I am the director for uh, uh, risk analysis and uh, research at uh, the Autorité de Contrôle Prudentiel et de Résolution. So in this panel, we will touch upon the issue of uh, climate stress testing. So in a way, uh, uh, like uh, Irene already did, uh, focusing on this uh, key uh, uh, development. So we will focus on two main issues. The first one is uh, what are the main lessons uh, drawn so far from climate stress test exercises? What are their main benefits and drawbacks? So that's the first aspect that we will, we will uh, deal with. And the second one is uh, about the future of, of these exercises, and in particular, what are the needed changes to make them uh, efficient, in particular useful for the risk management of financial firms. One aspect also is uh, whether and how we could uh, eventually add supervisory uh, requirements, like regulatory uh, capital, as this is something that is really binding for financial firms and which may also trigger uh, changes in the way in which uh, they conduct this uh, kind of uh, analysis. So in order to, uh, to address these two issues, we will have uh, four speakers. So you already know Irene and Jean. Uh, Jean will uh, participate in the panel as a uh, the head of uh, the NGFS, the network, the head of the Secretariat of the NGFS, sorry. Uh, the, the NGFS is the network for greening the financial system. It's a network uh, that was launched by the Banque de France, but John will tell you more about that. Um, and then we have also uh, Christopher Koch. Uh, Christopher is head of the stress testing uh, uh, expert division at the European Central Bank. And we will have also uh, Marc uh, Irubeta Goyone, uh, who is uh, um, in charge of the group uh, stress testing at uh, BNP Paribas, and is also in charge of the global stress testing and financial institution uh, simulation platform of BNPP. So uh, we will start first with Christopher. So Christopher will uh, introduce this panel as 
maybe as you may know, the ECB is currently running a, a very uh, uh, challenging stress testing exercise. So may, maybe Christophe, if, if you can present what you are doing and what are perhaps the first insight that you, 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 you get from the, the replies of, of the, the banks, which is uh, very new. So you, you will tell us about, about that. So Christopher, the floor is yours. OK. So thanks very much, uh, Laurent. And uh, thanks also for, for Laurent and the organizers for inviting me here. I'm very delighted to be here. Um, so as uh, Laurent mentioned, I will be speaking a bit about the uh, ongoing ECB climate risk stress test, and in particular focusing on some of the scenario of choices and considerations we have had in this context. I'm not sure I can say so much about the findings yet. I mean, we just had the first data coming in, so it's still very much work in progress. Uh, but at least I can offer some reflections about the, some of the choices we made uh, before the exercise started. Um, so let's see if I can, yeah. So just um, as a high level point in terms of when we started reflecting on, on the scenarios that we wanted to, to include in the exercise, the three say, salient features that we thought would be important is that on one hand, climate change is a, as it has a pervasive and global nature, so one needs to have a very comprehensive view. Secondly, uh, compared to regular stress tests, of course, the time horizon is much longer this, in this context, so that's another element that we needed to bring into to the picture. But then at the same time, also short-term actions, policies, and distress situations are also relevant. So, so we also wanted to have a, say, a more short-term uh, focus as well on, on top of the more longer-term features of, of the exercise. So a few words before going to, to the scenarios themselves. Um, um, this is uh, say our first, it's the bottom-up exercise, uh, the first of its kind that we are doing for what concerns climate risks. It has a lot of new pioneering features, We're building a lot on, on what has been done by ACPR and Bonne de France, but, but for us, this is a new endeavor. And what we usually, the way we usually phrase this is that this is a learning exercise both for us as supervisors, but I think also for the, for the banks that we, we supervise and that participate in this uh, exercise. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that uh, beyond just being a stress test, it's also a lot about uh, say a data collection exercise. We are asking a lot of new data breakdowns, granular information on sectoral, uh, at very granular level at sectoral exposures, uh, energy performance certificates, scope one, two, and three emissions data, and so on. So also for the banks, we acknowledge this is a, a challenging endeavor. Uh, and it, yeah. the exercise as such is also acting as a bit of a catalyst to, to push the industry to, to get these data, which we think are important uh, from a risk management and, and stress testing perspective uh, in order. Uh, but of course, we will also use the exercise to create awareness of climate risk, to identify banks' vulnerabilities, um, to try to understand uh, banks' climate stress testing frameworks, uh, how the level of their preparedness also in, in, in relation to the guidance we have provided a couple of years ago in terms of uh, climate-related and environmental risk management approaches. Um, and as such, we will try to identify best practices uh, uh, and also limitations that banks are facing now to, to, to help them bring going, go in, going forward uh, for future uh, exercises. See, the fact that it's kind of an exploratory learning exercise also uh, 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 for that reason, we also decided not to, to publish bank level results, but only go out with some aggregate findings at the end of the exercise. Also, the exercise compared to our regular stresses will also have no direct capital impact. Uh, there would be some qualitative, quantitative findings that may fit into our so-called FRAP assessments, but there would be no uh, direct capital impacts. Um, so that's a bit the background or the, the role objectives of the exercise. Now, turning to the scenarios that we are considering, um, given the, say, exploratory nature of the exercise, as I mentioned, and also the high level of uncertainty surrounding climate change, um, 
what we decided was to, to not rely on one single adverse scenario as we usually do in, in our stress tests, but actually work with a number of, of different types of, of scenarios and, 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 and uh, components. So we, we try to cover both transition risk and physical risk respectively. And for what concerns transition risk, we operate with, on the one hand with some long-term scenarios based building on the NGFS uh, scenarios covering a 30-year horizon uh, where we have three different scenarios. One is what we call orderly, so basically that climate policies, carbon taxation and so on are phased in on a gradual and orderly fashion over the 30-year period. And then we have a disorderly uh, scenario where also climate policies are phased in, but only much later and more abruptly. Uh, and then finally, a so-called hothouse scenario where uh, no, no policies on top of what is already there are taken, which then entails some, some physical damage at the end of the horizon. Um, and in addition to, to that, we also wanted to have a more say, near term assessment of, of stress. So we also include a, a, a short term transition scenario, um, which is basically a front, a front loading of, of the disorderly scenario that we consider for the long term for the, for the next three years and then run a, a, say a regular three-year type of horizon uh, stress test on, on that. Um, then for what concerns physical risks, we um, consider two different uh, scenarios here, both instantaneous one-year uh, shocks, uh, on the one hand, a drought and heat uh, risk scenario, and then um, on the other hand, uh, uh, a flood risk scenario. So that's it for, 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 for the scenarios that, that we are considering. So um, in terms of the uh, say the much um, evasion, much evasions and speaking to some of the points that, that Laurent mentioned, both in terms of the choices we made and, and the challenge we, challenge, challenges we have faced so far and, and how we see it going forward. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the choices in the, the scenario selection that we have made here, uh, this is kind of based on, on the, um, yeah, the uncertainty, the complexity, uh, and, and they say the exploratory nature of, of the exercise, as I mentioned. Um, so uh, we decided to have, uh, instead of just one scenario, to have uh, work with multiple scenarios to be able to cover as many aspects as, as possible, or to working with different time horizons from one to 30 year horizons. Um, and on the one hand, I mean, these long term scenarios, what we also, another key element of that is that we here also allow for dynamic balance sheets. Uh, so that banks over this 30-year horizon can ask to indicate how they would change their business models and, and their location of exposures depending on each of these scenarios uh, so that's to, to give us some, some insights into the strategic thinking of, of, of the banks in terms of this transition that is coming. At the same time, we also wanted to have some near-term uh, stress events, so that's also why we wanted to, to, to incorporate these more short-term aspects uh, as well. Now, in terms of challenges that we have faced uh, in, in the scenario design, I think one, one key, key element here, uh, I mean, we decided to build on, on the NGFS scenarios. Uh, they were already there. They uh, have been vetted also by all the central banks in our remit. Um, at the same time, we also think that, uh, say, from a climate risk perspective, the sectoral uh, dimension is, is crucial in the sense that banks can be exposed to different to companies uh, with different carbon intensities. So it, say the sectoral exposures um, matters a lot. So what we did in the scenarios, especially in the transition scenarios, was to build some sectoral models, uh, say firm level models that could then be added to some sectoral shocks uh, within the broader scenario. So I think that that component was, uh, was key for us to, to get a meaningful exercise. But of course, it was a challenge to, to create the, these models. Um, um, uh, then a another thing that uh, where we kind of took a bit of a shortcut this time around was in terms of having some relevant near-term scenarios where, as mentioned, what we did was basically to front load the uh, disorderly long-term scenario to the, the first three years, uh, to, to basically to the next three years, uh, which of course is a little bit uh, of, a, of a shortcut and, and, and not too sophisticated. So. From that perspective, we think that, that more work in terms of creating uh, realistic uh, near-term scenarios would, would definitely benefit 
us from, from, from a stress testing perspective. Um, another say, um, challenge I, I found was that okay, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of thinking about the future, but there's a little bit of a lack of, of history uh, that, that one can use to calibrate uh, the shocks as sh what we usually do in, in regular stress tests when we design adverse scenarios is that we take kind of the, 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 the percentile, the, the 95th percentile of, of the distribution of GDP, unemployment and so on, but this is much more difficult in, in this case. Um, so uh, that leads me to, to the next point about uh, severity here. Uh, it's another question that we are kind of asking ourselves now. Um, what is the relevance in severity in, in a climate risk stress test uh, context? I mean, the NTFS scenarios, if you look at them in the long term, they are kind of, in my view, a little bit of a, a kind of baseline configure, baselines with different climate shock related configurations, which of course is relevant. But, but if you think about a stress test, usually what you, what you want to have in an adverse scenario is a negative growth, a recession, and then, of course, how to combine that with, with a climate. Uh, climate risk is something that uh, I think we will be, be looking into go, going forward, especially for what concerns near-term um, scenarios. Um, and then again, what we did uh, in this exercise was to try to, I mean, cover both transition risk and physical risk, but we did it kind of in distinct ways, and they are kind of isolated exercises in it as such. So going forward, it might also be useful to have models that kind of encapsulate all or both types of, of risk in a, in a, in a comprehensive and, and consistent manner. So I think that would also be, be useful for, for our purposes. But uh, I think I will stop here and then, of course, we can. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. So, uh, Mark, if you want to take the floor. So, Mark represents a lucky institution which uh, not only participated in the ACPS stress test exercise, but also the, the ECB one. Uh, perhaps, Mark, uh, um, uh, Christopher talked about uh, also one aspect uh, on which you can give you your views, which is uh, this issue of short-term versus long-term scenarios. Short-term scenarios are useful for banks because, uh, in a way, they are related to their strategic horizons. But on the other hand, long-term uh, matter as well in order to prepare for, for this transition and physical risk. So the, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Long. Uh, indeed, uh, we are playing uh, uh, the ECB uh, climate stress test exercise, uh, which is uh, very demanding, uh, as Christopher has just uh, presented, uh, with uh, a real change in terms of data acquisition and uh, numerous scenarios to play, uh, uh, covering both uh, credits and for, for the mid-term horizon uh, market risk also. Uh, we are still not uh, covering uh, business uh, risk, operational risk quantitatively, uh, but it will sure uh, come. Um, in terms of horizons, uh, clearly we favor long-term horizons uh, since uh, uh, we, we think that uh, in the assessment uh, we, we conduct having a dynamic balance sheet uh, and so uh, being able to um, uh, convey uh, the way uh, the various sectors uh, will adapt and the way uh, banking institutions uh, will uh, 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 prioritize uh, their, their funding uh, is something important uh, in, the, in the, the assessment. And uh, uh, on a mid-term horizon, uh, as done by ECB, on a three-year horizon, uh, it, you can't have uh, that, that analysis of uh, this uh, long-term uh, adaptation of the sectors and also uh, a, a real uh, switch uh, in the sectoral uh, exposure uh, of the banking books. So uh, we, we think that it's important to, to, to keep uh, these uh, long-term exercises uh, and uh, uh, in, in terms of impact assessment uh, for climate change, uh, we believe that they are more realistic uh, than uh, uh, shorter term uh, exercises. Then we understand uh, what ECB uh, has wanted to do uh, with uh, this three-year uh, horizon exercise, which is to bring closer uh, to uh, uh, an ICAP uh, horizon or traditional regulatory stress test uh, horizon, uh, the, uh, the impact assessment of a disorderly uh, transition scenario. And uh, uh, 
we are also in favor uh, of uh, uh, leveraging uh, uh, the bank's frameworks uh, in assessing the potential capital uh, consequences uh, uh, of these um, uh, climate risk factors. And so uh, if uh, a way uh, to assess this uh, capital need is by playing uh, um, low probability scenario uh, uh, which are uh, run uh, with a static balance sheet approach, so not depicting this uh, evolution of the economy uh, to have something which is uh, easier, easier to compare between the institutions, uh, we, are, we are also, also uh, totally uh, willing uh, to, play, uh, to play that approach. We, we strongly believe that we need to keep uh, the two types of exercises uh, one, uh, the long-term scenario approach being uh, more uh, uh, financial communication or uh, risk assessment uh, exercise, and uh, the other uh, short-term uh, approach uh, being probably more uh, a capital determination oriented uh, uh, type of exercise. And then, uh, so in terms of uh, feedback on, on, on the exercise, uh, it's demanding, uh, but uh, uh, as a French bank, uh, we, we must recognize that it's in continuity with uh, uh, what we had run uh, with uh, uh, Banque de France uh, in 2020. Uh, and so um, uh, we, we had already uh, started uh, our um, climate roadmap uh, in terms of stress testing. Uh, it's just a large number uh, and uh, also a sectoral approach uh, which is uh, pushed even further uh, which have to be uh, to be added so in terms of um, uh, climate uh, scenario uh, uh, usage in banks I don't know if I the right one yeah. um, we are obviously running uh, these uh, regulatory uh, or supervisory uh, exercises, as, as the one done uh, with ECB, uh, EBA, uh, the Euro European Banking uh, Authority had already uh, also run uh, uh, some uh, top-down uh, exercises. Uh, we have local supervisors uh, in UK, uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, uh, that are also uh, running their, their own uh, climate uh, scenario assessments. Um, so it's uh, uh, going fast. Uh, uh, on uh, uh, NGFS, uh, so the, the network for, for greening the, the financial, sy financial system, we have more than 30 uh, supervisors that have already launched uh, a climate scenario or, or that are working in the framing uh, of uh, uh, their own uh, approach. So it's really um, a wide uh, a spread uh, effort uh, on that uh, to, to, to which we, we fully uh, uh, contribute. Uh, internally, we are also uh, running our own uh, climate uh, scenario uh, in, in our uh, ICAP framework, so the internal uh, um, capital assessment uh, framework of the bank. Uh, and we believe that it's um, uh, uh, complementary exercises to, to, to have, um, uh, in fact, um, organized by supervisors uh, um, common uh, methodological uh, assessments uh, and at the same time for banks uh, to work uh, internally on uh, what can be a relevant uh, scenario uh, for, for their activity and uh, also some more uh, tailor-made uh, approaches uh, to, uh, to assess uh, the consequences for, for an institution of uh, these um, uh, climate uh, risk drivers. Uh, we are not only uh, working on uh, uh, climate scenarios for uh, these uh, supervisory or internal uh, risk assessment exercises. We are also uh, running uh, climate scenario analysis uh, for our portfolio alignment uh, exercises, uh, which are also uh, key uh, in, in the framing of our strategy and uh, in the adaptation of uh, 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 the origination uh, we want to, uh, uh, to, to push uh, in our banking book. Uh, and there, uh, in fact, we, we are uh, less um, uh, using NGFS scenarios, which are uh, rather macroeconomic uh, scenarios uh, with uh, this uh, global consistency, and, and rather uh, taking uh, IEA uh, scenarios that are more uh, um, uh, specific uh, to, to, to the various sectors of the, the economy 
uh, and uh, uh, closer to um, uh, the, the information in, on, in terms of uh, uh, assessment of the intensity of emission uh, of uh, uh, a part of our portfolios for a given sector, such as uh, uh, pa power or uh, automotive uh, or oil and gas, uh, where we will try to understand uh, in, in our uh, banking book as it is today uh, uh, for these sectors, uh, what is the average uh, intensity of emission uh, and uh, how uh, we can bring it uh, uh, either uh, uh, below uh, uh, the trajectory which is uh, designed in the uh, IEA uh, scenario for that sector. Uh, or uh, at the, av the level uh, expected uh, by uh, the, the net zero uh, transition uh, scenario. What we can say also is that today between uh, NGFS scenarios and uh, IEA uh, scenarios that are more uh, uh, sector oriented, uh, we don't have a full consistency. So uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, totally the definition, for example, of uh, uh, the price of uh, carbon uh, is not the same uh, between uh, these two sets uh, of uh, uh, scenarios. A um, lot of um, uh, hypotheses on the way uh, that transition uh, will, be, will be made uh, are different between uh, the, the two scenarios. As I've said, IAEA will be more uh, uh, specific uh, in terms of how sector per sector the transition is, is done. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a concern for, for the banks uh, today uh, in the sense that um, we will uh, communicate uh, to the markets uh, our uh, uh, strategy of adaptation of our uh, banking books uh, and, 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 and the way um, uh, we will uh, uh, monitor uh, the al alignment of our portfolios with uh, these uh, IEA uh, scenarios. And at the same time, clearly, on uh, um, uh, more supervisory or uh, in internal uh, uh, scenario uh, analysis, we will also communicate, uh, uh, and the ECB will also communicate uh, outcomes. And so we think that uh, there is still work uh, to be done uh, to build uh, a set uh, of scenarios that could uh, uh, join, in fact, this um, uh, macroeconomic uh, approach as we have uh, with NGFS scenarios and the more uh, sector uh, focused uh, approach uh, we have in uh, IEA to ensure an ability to, to keep consistency uh, in, in the various communications uh, that, will, uh, that will occur uh, and, and, and make these um, uh, alignment of portfolios uh, uh, commitments banks are, are, are taking um, uh, easier to, to reconcile with uh, risk assessments uh, that we, we are working on uh, in, in all these uh, various uh, supervisory exercises and internal exercises. That's all for me. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. So I, I will now uh, give the floor to Jean. So uh, uh, both Christopher and Mark touch upon uh, the role of GNGFS, but with a concern expressed by Mark about the possible uh, discrepancy between uh, the scenarios developed by the NGFS and widely used by supervisors and alternative scenarios which may be more adapted to, to banks' uh, focus. So can you tell us more about what the NGFS is doing and what are the next steps in order in a way to account for the, the concerns and, and also uh, deal with the issue of uh, short-term versus long-term scenarios? Indeed, uh, many thanks, uh, Laurent. Um, so uh, maybe in a nutshell, NGFS and, and scenarios are, <coughs> you know, uh, it's, it's almost a love story uh, because I think one of the main drivers that uh, brought, brought together uh, the founding members of the NGFS was, for example, the idea that uh, we would need to, uh, to develop scenarios, but uh, uh, take <coughs> any one institution in the NGFS, I think no one is able to do it on its, uh, on its own. Just to give you a flavor of what it entails, uh, bringing together these scenarios, uh, at the peak point, uh, in, the, in the three weeks before we, we release, uh, it may be up to uh, 150 people in all the institution reviewing the, reviewing the data, the results, and providing uh, comments and, and feedback. So it's, it's really trying to leverage on the, um, the, the collective knowledge, uh, but not just knowledge, also local insight, for example, uh, from all of the NGFS uh, members. Uh, 
it started at, uh, with, with eight founding members. We are now uh, 108 and, and uh, 16 observers spanning you know, all across the, the world. So we, we are very much trying to tap into uh, the knowledge and the experience of the, uh, of the, of the members. Uh, one thing we, I think is important, uh, that, that, and we are learning together uh, in, in, uh, in doing so. Uh, among the things we, we are learning, for example, uh, the fact that uh, people use the word scenarios but mean very different things uh, in, in that uh, respect. And, and part of uh, what uh, was just mentioned, you know, the discrepancy between a, a, an IEA scenario and an NGFS scenario, uh, also boils down to the fact that uh, these are very different objects, not meant to, to do the same, uh, the same thing. Uh, you have very little macroeconomy in an IEA scenario, uh, but you have a lot of thinking that went into, uh, you know, how is it optimal to adapt the energy system of uh, the various countries uh, to make sure that we are uh, cost minimizing the transition. I'm, I'm uh, um, being a bit um, loose here, but that's the, the, the general idea. On the other end, the, the, the NGFS scenarios uh, did try to frame these questions uh, in a, in a macro-financial uh, perspective, making sure that not only we get uh, the transition, for example, or the physical risk uh, right, but also that we capture the macroeconomic dynamics that will come with, uh, with them. Uh, it, may be, it may well be the case uh, that uh, the macroeconomics of the transition will matter more than the microeconomics of it. I think that's part of the things that, that we have learned in the, in the past uh, uh, few, few months. Uh, and, and I think it is, an impor it, it is important to realize that because, in fact, uh, what we are confronti confronted with is, is not just a question of a series of shocks at the sectorial level. It's a transformation of, of the economy. And, and for the banks, uh, understanding what it entails from a macro perspective and for central banks as well, is maybe as important as understanding the, the impact on the various uh, on the various uh, sectors. Um, just with regard to uh, to the NGFS uh, uh, scenarios, why why do we uh, care about these scenarios? We think that it's it's good that we at least uh, on the supervisory side side we have a, a common language to speak about uh, to speak about these scenarios and some kind of global consistency. Uh, I insisted already on the joint development of these scenarios, which uh, is, is, a, is a big plus for us. But it's also a way of, uh, you should think about it in a dynamic way, uh, basically, and looking forward, uh, we expect the scenarios to be enriched by the experience of the various, uh, the various uh, members. Uh, we are uh, starting to work on a, on a joint report with the FSB, uh, drawing from the uh, results from the various exercises. I mean, uh, uh, that it was already mentioned that more than 30 exercises are being uh, uh, run or uh, prepared uh, around the world. Uh, when we try to aggregate this, uh, these results, it's important that we start from the same, uh, basically the same broad picture wise, the same scenarios. Uh, but also when we, when we will combine them, we will learn something. And I think for the next generation of stress tests or scenarios, at uh, actually, it will be very useful to be able to uh, you know, understand what, uh, what were the results of the first round to enrich the development of the of the next uh, the next uh, round. Um, with regard with what's uh, what's ahead of us from a, an NGFS uh, perspective, uh, I think for the time being we're very much focused on scenarios. But as you would have uh, um, get from the the, the two presentation uh, before me, uh, it's it's uh, there are some methodological challenges that comes with uh, with the climate stress testing. And I, I would expect that the next uh, work program of the NGFS, uh, starting in a few weeks now, will also touch on these uh, methodological aspects, which, which are important ones. Um, I think there will also be some kind of improvement of the scenarios. We have already always been clear that uh, the scenarios were not perfect, but we release them to be able to uh, have people using them and, and get feedback and to be able to, to improve on it. So for example, uh, the uh, uh, physical risk side of the scenarios is, uh, is not as good as it should, uh, but uh, thanks to Irene, we will be making progress uh, <laughs> uh, soon. Uh, but, um, but indeed, I mean, when we, when we release the scenario and add uh, something like a 15% uh, uh, GDP loss associated with physical risk, we see that very much as you know, the, the lower bound of the impact because we don't model yet uh, the acute risk in the, in the scenarios. And we don't model that yet because it's very difficult actually to, to capture the macroeconomic implication of this uh, 
this acute, uh, this acute risk. Uh, so uh, improving the scenarios, updating the, the data, uh, and also, as, as was uh, mentioned, working more on the, on the macroeconomics, uh, refining that, uh, and, and providing some kind of uh, guidelines to develop adverse scenarios, because indeed that's uh, something that, that was a big ask from, from the first user of the, of the scenarios. Uh, the scenarios that are in the public domain, uh, you should see them as being representative of various uh, IPCC scenarios, sort of. Uh, but you can imagine that things don't play exactly as favorably or as, uh, you know, the, the it can be even worse than, than what's in the scenario. Uh, and providing some guidance to develop adverse scenarios will also be part of the, be part of the, of the game. Uh, and... Um, uh, finally, uh, one last uh, point on, on that is also making sure that we manage the model risk that, that is associated with the development of, uh, of scenarios. We are already using a set of models, uh, but we don't pretend that any of these models is the reality. Uh, so we will need to, to find a way of uh, you know, providing with the, the users with a, a very good understanding of the variability that can come from using, uh, using uh, uh, various uh, models. My final point is on the uh, uh, different uses of the scenarios. The scenarios were developed for risk assessment purposes, but indeed there is an ask for uh, using them for disclosure purposes, all that kind of things. But, uh, but then we have a collective uh, uh, learning curve to, to, to climb, uh, uh, because I mean, the scenarios you should use for one, is for one type of uh, use is not exactly the same kind of the scenarios you can use for another one. And the first, the first step in that respect will actually be, and this is my conclusion, but also getting back to my first point, understanding how you better connect the uh, sectorial scenarios like the IPPC, the um, uh, IEA, for example, with the, uh, the NGFS uh, uh, scenarios to really understand how you can jump from one to another, fr from one set of scenarios to another set of scenarios, but also from one type of use of scenarios to another one of the set of uh, use. Thank you, Jean. So last uh, speaker, but not least, uh, Irene. So what, what are your views uh, on the current practice of stress testing and recommendation from a, an academic point of view? Irene, so the floor is okay. yours. Yes, thank you. So first of all, while they are loading the slides, yes, thank you. Uh, let, me, uh, do, uh, let me do my, the academic, uh, represent the academic uh, work here and academic point of view. First of all, what the... NGFS and central banks have been doing on working with climate scenarios and the integration into macroeconomic and financial, model is, uh, financial models is super important and has been really a fast and massive development in the last two years because, central, uh, because until two years ago we were still discussing whether central banks should do anything about the climate. So this should be really rewarded. Uh, in this regard, uh, I would just uh, say a couple of words about uh, uh, connecting to what uh, Jeanne just mentioned about the worst case scenarios. When we talk about uh, physical risk, we, uh, it's true that in the NGFS you have mostly chronic risk. We saw before in my presentation what, um, what happens when you add asset level exposure to acute risk. Another point that we should also consider is that so far we are considering individual sources of risk or hazards. But actually what we see already in several countries is that climate physical risk can compound. For instance, you have a flood and then you have landslides. And when this happens, when risk compounds, losses are amplified uh, in the economy. And this could, be, could make, of course, any, um, could, um, increased challenges, both for recovery in the economy, but also for uh, financial institutions like lenders. So uh, my first message is that the next, uh, I mean, the future of climate stress test with regards to scenarios should be on compound risk. Last year, we showed as a result of a one year and a half project with the World Bank, why compound climate physical risk matter in the economy uh, and for uh, financial stability. And this should be really one of the focus uh, we believe. Then let's go back to transition risk. The most of the work has been done so far on transition risk and uh, uh, Christopher before showed uh, uh, that the ECB picked in particular the disorderly transition scenarios because those are the risky ones. 
well, let me challenge a bit this, <laughs> this idea uh, here, which is, of course, uh, make, make a lot of sense, but we might have also unexpected risk in an orderly scenario. And this is based, what I'm telling now is based on a, a paper that we published last year on science and it's co-authored with Stefano Battistone and uh, K1 Riai and uh, Bas van Reuven from IASA. Um, those are the guys who have been developing the, one of the three integrated assessment models used in the NGFS exercise and are maintaining the um, uh, database explorer of the NGFS. A big, what's missing in transition uh, scenarios? The endogeneity of risk. Uh, and this matters for both the political economy and the low carbon transition and can make the difference between achieving or missing the climate targets. What, do I, what does it mean? Uh, NGFS climate mitigation scenarios are already become a reference tool for investors, banks, financial institutions, as you've heard before, um, are using these scenarios to do their climate stress test. So these scenarios can already shift markets' expectations today. However, and this is <laughs> what matters here, is that these scenarios don't account for the impact of investors looking at the scenarios and potentially reacting to them, taking them into account. This missing feedback loop, which is what we call endogeneity, is crucial for financial stability and for achieving the climate targets because it could lead to an adjustment in financial risk assessment, which in turn is crucial for capital allocation. So in particular, increasing investment in climate aligned activities, decreasing from uh, climate misaligned activities. So in this context, we introduced a framework to model the interaction between expectations and scenarios and generate new scenarios, which are transition scenarios, which are more coherent with the investment needs and the climate targets. The scenarios shortly here connect uh, actually the output of the one of the integrated assessment models, so these are process-based integrated assessment models, um, with climate financial risk assessment in a, a stress test uh, financial network framework. And what is the uh, connecting variable here is the adjustment in the cost of capital. So we consider investors in the uh, climate financial risk module that look at the trajectories by, uh, of shocks by uh, sector uh, output provided by the integrated assessment models across the different transition scenarios, uh, in particular uh, orderly, disorderly, and consider net zero or current policies and so on, they adjust the uh, interest rate, so the uh, risk premium, the risk premium leads to an adjustment in the uh, financial risk metrics like value at risk, climate value at risk, and feedback in the investment decision in the integrated assessment model. What we obtain by doing so, well, are very dif are different trajectories, both for a uh, um, delayed transition, so what um, we um, talk about uh, as disorderly transition, and orderly transition. How to read these two figures? The, um, um, <coughs> the thick line trajectories are uh, the trajectories that we obtain from the integrated assessment models for two, sec two uh, sectors, so aggregate renewable energy, it's the green one, and uh, aggregated um, uh, energy out production out of coal. Uh, from 2020 to 2050. The vertical line uh, represents the introduction of the climate policy, which in an orderly transition, so immediate climate policy, the, boss, the box on the uh, bottom left is at 2020. In a disorderly transition, so which is the top right box, in a delayed climate policy, is set to occur in 2030. Well, we, we see some trajectories. We see that, for instance, in a disorderly transition, uh, sorry, in an orderly transition, the adjustment, so if you look at the uh, energy output in the bottom left uh, box, the energy uh, output adjustment is going to be smooth, so an increase in renewables and a smooth decrease in, in coal. On, uh, on the contrary, in a disorderly transition, we will have uh, more abrupt trajectories, which uh, could lead to an 
with respect to an adjustment in asset prices. But what happens when we consider this approach, so when we consider investors looking at the scenarios, adjusting uh, the uh, cost of capital, the financial risk assessment, and feeding it back to the investment decision in the YAM. These are the dotted lines that you see here. And you can see it both in terms of energy output as asset value, which is the second part of each box. Well, what happens, if we, let's start from the uh, bottom left panel. When we can think that the transition will be smooth because we are in an orderly scenario, but if investors don't adjust the risk assessment and in, in our simplified framework, the cost of capital, well, the transition will take much more similar trajectories to what we call a disorderly uh, transition, meaning that we will have a more abrupt adjustment in output, which will reflect in larger asset price volatility, both for renewables and coal. And we know that this could be bad for financial stability. On the contrary, when we consider that we are in a uh, disorderly, so delayed uh, transition because we have delayed climate policy, so the mm, top right panel, but investors look at the scenarios and anticipate them. So you see that there is a reaction, on the dotted lines that starts before 2030, then the adjustment in investments in the economy and asset value will be much smoother. So what we show here is that when we consider the endogeneity of risk that comes from uh, the interplay between uh, investments and financial expectations, you can endogenize, endogenize the orderly and disorderly characteristics of the scenarios having uh, actually, uh, and this opens I mean, uh, the way for uh, considering what role investors could play and under which conditions it could be enabling or hampering. In the, in the transition. Thank you very much, Irene. Do we have time to take one question or shall we stop now? A quick question. Is there a quick question? Yes, there is. Stéphane Voisin. Thank you. A, a quick question to, to, to Christopher. Uh, on the transition risk, uh, you're, you're basing your, uh, your trajectories on the 30 years um, time horizon, but on the physical risk, you, you, you're living on a one-year basis, which seems quite short, and it doesn't seem that in your, in, in, your, in your wishes for the futures, you're not trying to increase this time horizon. Why, what's the reason for this? I mean, considering everything has been said by Jean and uh, other people there. Uh, <coughs> oh, thanks, thanks for the question. Yes, indeed, um, for what concerns the, the physical risk scenarios, we, we thought, I mean, it's, it's a bit stylized, we fully, fully admit that, so it, it's basically what we assume is basically that there's a flood risk happening basically now, and then we look at it, how, how does that affect collateral values, for example, over this next, over one year, over one year horizon, but of course, that's, that's really more uh, an acute stress, but nothing really chronic and nothing that is, say, related to, to the broader macro uh, macroeconomy, uh, I mean, in the NTFS scenarios, as, as we also mentioned, there is some, some element of, of physical damage as well, but, but yeah, it, the channel there is, is maybe still a little bit, bit weak. Um, but yeah, so that's why we, we also wanted to have something, uh, a physical risk uh, component, uh, say, beyond what is in the, in the NTFS scenarios, which focus more on the transition uh, risk. Uh, so. So that was kind of the reason, but, but we do admit that it's indeed a little bit um, stylized, but it's, it's just to, to get some, some action and see, based on banks' current exposures, uh, what would happen if we, say, had a, a flood risk, and then we have a map of, what we do here is a map of Europe, where we kind of at very regional level, uh, we have map which regions are more or less exposed to, to flood risk, for example, and then depending on, on, on banks, say, regional exposures, we could be more or less affected by that and, and a bit similar on, on the uh, drought and, and heat risk. Um, but indeed, I fully take the point that this is uh, probably a bit stylized, to say the least. But okay, thank you. So perhaps just a quick reaction to what uh, Irene said, because she, she in a way set up the roadmap 
for the future exercises. So, so far, what has been presented are micro-oriented frameworks. So in a way, they do not take into account endogeneity, spillovers, uh, feedback loops, just a direct impact of climate change to institutions. And second, there are bottom-up exercises in which uh, firms are asked to provide these impacts, but obviously it's very difficult then to factor in the other sector's reactions, which uh, do not necessarily participate in these exercises, but uh, at least uh, to Jean and to, to Christopher, uh, you have the roadmap for, for the next uh, years. So thanks a lot and uh, have a good day uh, on climate change issues. Right, so uh, me again, perhaps not for the last time, but uh, you're getting close to, uh, to it. Uh, I think the next keynote is provided by Stanislas Potier. Did I? Oh yeah, Stanislas. Uh, Stanislas is a, a senior advisor to the general management of, uh, of Amundi. And uh, my guess is that uh, he, will, uh, he will present um, the uh, highlights the, the best parts of uh, the recent report that he contributed to um, uh, on the, you know, how uh, financial center uh, can uh, coordinate itself uh, to, to uh, increase uh, and enhance in its contribution to the, to the transition. Stanislas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jean, uh, and good morning to all. Um, so I have, uh, like, 20 minutes, is that right? And then five minutes uh, for questions? Okay. Um, well, so I, I, um, I speak English, but uh, I'll try to, to, to pay attention to some words because the, the report uh, that uh, Yves Perrier um, handed over to the French finance minister uh, 10 days ago um, is very precise in, in, the, in the analysis uh, and the recommendations. So the, the origin of the report, uh, this Perrier report, so as you know, Yves Perrier uh, has been CEO of Amundi for close to 14 years and is now the chairman of Amundi, um, was that the, the finance ministry uh, found that maybe we, the financial place, uh, Paris place, uh, was not going uh, far enough and quick enough uh, to fight climate change and to help uh, the transition. So how could we um, do more and where, where are we standing? That, that, that was the request uh, for the report. So the report uh, is available, by the way, on the um, ministry uh, website. Maybe we will uh, put it on the, uh, on the site of, uh, of the conference. Uh, it's available in French, full report. It will be available in English, I guess, in maybe two weeks, uh, something like that, but you already have an executive summary, 15 page, where you have more or less everything, uh, already available in French and in English. Um, and we, we try to be comprehensive. So we, we first uh, uh, talked about uh, what are we uh, talking about um, and uh, why do we have all these political commitments uh, on climate change? So uh, are we, I'm not going to, to explain to you the importance of, uh, of climate change or the conclusions of the IPCC uh, several reports, but uh, we have uh, really uh, clear commitments, international commitments now to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century, which is absolutely, uh, I mean, uh, paramount uh, and, and a very, uh, and entails a huge effort. Uh, and if we, uh, we have that, of course, uh, but I will talk uh, of that a bit later. It means that uh, ahead of this uh, uh, end of the century, we have to do many, many things in, in the coming years. Uh, these uh, international commitments have been also translated and, com and completed by uh, some regional commitments, and particularly in Europe. Uh, Europe chose to be um, in the front line and really ahead and uh, give uh, some sort of example. So uh, now we have several Again, I will not enter uh, into details, but several set of rules. Uh, the most important one may be the Fit for 55 uh, package, 
which is uh, very demanding because it, it means that by 2030 we have to, to uh, decrease our carbon emissions by 55% as uh, compared to 1990. Uh, this is not already translated into the French regulation, but it will uh, soon be the case uh, uh, next year, and, and most of uh, member states have uh, national regulations that translate all these international commitments into, uh, into national law. Um, so, what does it mean? And, and here again, we want it to be really uh, uh, at the same time complete and synthetic in the report, it means a huge global industrial revolution. People, uh, most of the time, say that, oh, it's some sort of easy, we just get out of the fossil fuels, we just get out of the ground and focus on the, on the green. Uh, it's true that the heart of the matter, of course, is uh, the uh, revolution of the energy mix, but not only. Uh, we're talking about converting uh, the global energy mix uh, uh, to uh, carbon free and today uh, we have only 20% of the primary energy uh, carbon free and we have to more or less double uh, the electricity production capacity worldwide you have mm, close to 800 million with, without access to electricity in the world so there is no reason why they shouldn't uh, have access and uh, since we're converting a lot of products uh, and, and services uh, to electricity uh, we will have to, to invest massively in, uh, in electricity capacity. That means to multiply bit more or less uh, between seven to ten times what we have today. Um, but of course, uh, this is also uh, true for other sectors. And, it, and we, we just um, set some uh, uh, data on the most uh, uh, emissive uh, sectors like uh, heavy industry, uh, transportation, uh, building uh, and construction, and uh, also, uh, of course, uh, agribusiness, uh, agriculture and agribusiness. Um, and um, to um, what we're talking about here is, of course, to change uh, products, services, to change the way they are made, uh, all the value chains, to change the uh, usage of these products and services, uh, consumption uh, behaviors. So this is really a, a huge transformation of our economies and our societies worldwide again. So we have more or less to uh, uh, rebuild what has been done uh, worldwide in 150 years, in 20 years uh, also. Uh, figures, uh, uh, various figures of, co of course are available as um, assessment of the, the need for investment to do that. Um, we can um, think about uh, three to five trillion dollars per year worldwide and one trillion euros uh, per year for Europe to be uh, carbon neutral in 2050. So you see that uh, we will have to find the money and we will have to direct and to allocate resources to where they need to go to, uh, for this transformation. This is, of course, the role, uh, but not only, of, uh, of financial. Um, and uh, this um, revolution will not give any new uh, value news. You know, we will still have some planes, some cars, some uh, uh, heating systems, or, or, or um, what do you say? Um, uh, oh, that's, well, anyway, a cooling system, sorry. But, um, the, and they will function differently, of course, carbon-free, but we will, we will not have anything more. Uh, and we might have something less, because uh, also uh, behaviors of, cons uh, of consumers will have to change. So uh, here, the, the organization of all this, the uh, just transition, the acceptance capacity of societies, uh, and uh, who will pay what, because uh, this amount of money, of course, will have to be, to be paid by all the stakeholders, which mean uh, more or less uh, taxpayers, consumers, and capital. Uh, it will have to be organized, what we, we say, by a new uh, political economy. And this political economy is uh, a new way of uh, really co-building and co-managing uh, all this transformation by corporates, financial, and the state. States will probably have to uh, reassess their involvement in economy uh, and society and give more certainty uh, uh, to, on the medium long term, some choices 
cannot be made uh, out of uh, public authorities. Uh, when you think about by, uh, the, uh, of the energy mix, uh, uh, corporates can't really uh, dive in unless uh, they have some uh, certainty uh, of uh, on the, the, the place, the role of the nuclear uh, energy, the gas, um, the level, uh, the, the, the pace of um, increase of renewables, uh, all these, uh, all this has uh, have to be organized again uh, in co-construction. That means not only from the state, but the state discussing with what is possible from uh, uh, the point of view of industrial uh, corporations and also uh, alignment with the financial. This is not really the case uh, today. So, um, and uh, signals will have to be sent, of course, because uh, again, there will be some equilibrium uh, uh, to, to be stricken be between uh, um, taxpayer, consumers, and capital. Everyone will have uh, to, uh, to pay the price. Uh, normal to send signals with, uh, for instance, carbon taxes or uh, carbon adjustment mechanisms uh, to, the, uh, to the consumer. Uh, also uh, quite uh, normal that the taxpayer is also um, playing uh, its role because we are in a collective uh, transformation and collective choices and capital. I mean the rate of return that uh, all this level of rate of returns uh, we used to uh, for the last, uh, we've been used to for the last 20 years are not uh, reasonable today. So we say clearly in the report that this level of uh, some uh, roughly 15% of return uh, will have to be reassessed, uh, of course, um, since we internalize this new externality of CO2, uh, it's normal that, uh, that we do not have the same uh, level of returns. Um, and of course, uh, the financials will have to find uh, new systems uh, to be really innovative uh, so that we can better uh, reallocate uh, long-term savings, for instance, uh, and, and all kind of resources to the transformation of economy, and also to find ways to channel some northern money to southern projects, because of course, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the bulk of the transformation worldwide lies also in uh, developing countries, economies, and infrastructures. So, uh, and we must always think uh, globally and not, uh, not only nationally or even regionally. So uh, we also try, but I will be quick on that, uh, to, to have a comprehensive assessment of what's, what are the frameworks uh, today, legal frameworks. Uh, and this is, I must say, quite complicated because uh, it's, it's really moving uh, every day. And you have uh, different sources of norm construction and uh, regulation building, um, both public and private, coming from at an international level, regional level, uh, national level. And uh, in Europe, you, you know that you have uh, several streams, uh, ongoing streams uh, of regulations on carbon reporting, on um, communication and reporting on financial products, uh, and also uh, on CO2 and extra financial accountancy. Uh, dealt by EFRAG, a technical group uh, that has been used for years to uh, advise the uh, European Commission on, um, on accountancy rules uh, and, uh, and also uh, a very strong uh, involvement of uh, American and English uh, stakeholders. Uh, if you only think about uh, global alliances, of course, net zero alliances and uh, and the uh, IFRS and its new uh, body, ISSB, located in Frankfurt, and that also will be quite active in the coming months and most probably uh, lead to a, a framework on climate. Uh, and they're already talking, of course, with their uh, European counterparts. What we say, of course, is that we, we, we must make everything possible so that um, these frameworks are consistent together. Uh, um, because otherwise uh, we will not be able to create some uh, strong signals to the market uh, and, uh, and build some market discipline. Uh, and today uh, we must acknowledge that the, uh, there is no consistency in the way uh, corporates are assessed uh, or even financial products uh, are assessed. So um, the, we make, of course, a special uh, case on the green taxonomy, 
uh, green taxonomy is, um, of course, um, a very important new tool. Uh, it's um, some sort of uh, regional agreement on, on what is green as of today and what is not. But um, now all uh, we lie in the way we use the taxonomy. So, uh, and we say that there is a risk uh, that the taxonomy uh, might be used in a static way, which means that uh, uh, if we send all the money to what is already green and not to the brown, which has to be transformed into green, we will miss the point. Uh, and uh, on the contrary, we might even increase the cost of financing and cost of cap capital for all the brown who needs uh, the money to transform itself. So we, uh, we clearly uh, need, uh, we have this green as a, as a target, actually, and uh, this target will be reassessed regularly. Uh, taxonomy and uh, the, the European Commission say uh, every three years, I think, that they will reassess that and most probably uh, reassess the, the taxonomy uh, maybe every year. But uh, we, we really need to uh, focus on the brown uh, uh, enable the brand to get enough resources to transform itself and to become green. So that we, 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 we call this uh, approach a dynamic approach of taxonomy, taxonomy as a target, uh, but not missing the point of again um, putting money on the brand. This is very important because you, you have noticed of course that uh, many products uh, lately have focused on green parts. It's very easy uh, mo mostly for asset owners and asset managers, more than for banks, but to um, wash their uh, portfolios and exclude the brown and, and uh, uh, of course, over uh, wet the green. But it, it, doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't bring any uh, solution to uh, climate change fight and to uh, the transformation issue. Uh, again, uh, these assets uh, uh, navigate to some other uh, uh, some other owners, and uh, you, you don't accompany, you don't force, uh, you don't enable transformation. Uh, and of course, to do that, uh, we need some uh, analysis methodologies, and we do not have them today. So what we say is that we have in the two, three years to come to really build collectively, uh, not only of course the, the Paris financial place, but to build collectively um, some sort of consensus around what is a, a good corporate, so to speak, uh, uh, with a real um, uh, good uh, transition uh, strategy, uh, able to deliver with the uh, right uh, resources put uh, to their target. And uh, again, as we have a forecast assessment uh, in a credit uh, analysis or equity analysis, we uh, must have a, a forward assessment uh, in, uh, in climate uh, analysis, but for that, we must build uh, some consensus on criteria, indicators, uh, and all that. And this is not the case uh, uh, so far. But if we don't have that, again, we will not be able to, to build market, con uh, market uh, discipline. This has to be done, of course. Um, it's con construction uh, very widely. So even with uh, private actors, such as uh, indexes providers, uh, rating agencies, of course, because they are as important as regulators to build uh, market discipline and, uh, and uh, habits. So, um, again, I will not um, go too, too far uh, on the uh, organization of the Paris Financial Place. Uh, what we say is that we have to, well, there is broad recognition that Paris has been uh, more or less on the forefront uh, some years ago. Uh, with um, strong commitments, for instance, on coal. Uh, this is uh, agreed. There are plenty of initiatives, but maybe we lack uh, some coordination and, uh, and alignment, again, between, uh, between actors. And what we say is that if we uh, find a way of organizing ourselves and an, imp an implementation uh, process, that will be very useful, uh, of course, uh, much more uh, for everyone. Um, uh, abroad, in Europe and in the world. Asia is also very uh, keen on uh, doing more and faster. And um, what we propose is, again, a modus operandi. Now we have to implement this. We, we, every financial institution uh, have taken some um, commitments, targets, in 2050, in 2030, uh, sometimes with, uh, uh, with uh, more short, medium-term plans. Uh, 
uh, but now it has to be delivered. And how do we do that? Uh, we must uh, coordinate again uh, ourselves. So we propose a political body with some pressure from the state, very regular, and also uh, a place where you can arbitrate on some difficult issues, for instance, um, how to, uh, to finalize the CO2 accountancy. There are some principles that maybe uh, must be stricken that are um, quite complicated, uh, for instance, on scope three. Uh, but it's the same uh, I was just talking about on taxonomy uh, usage. And uh, a more operational body, uh, really um, piloting and managing all the different uh, work streams uh, with the, the recommendations. So um, recommendations, again, they are all in the executive summary. Uh, more or less, it's to build a CO2 accountancy. This is absolutely key because to build our uh, method, uh, analysis methodologies, we need robust information and, uh, and data. And we do not have that uh, yet, uh, particularly for scope three and taxonomy uh, usage. This has to be done with corporate, sector by sector. And what will be done in France can be, uh, of course, adapted by exported uh, to some uh, other places. And, uh, and it, again, we, we must think globally uh, all the time. Uh, we must build, again, some uh, consens consensus around uh, methodologies uh, of uh, analysis what is um, a transition, a climate transition corporate, what is, how to build portfolios, uh, bank portfolios, asset managers portfolios. Uh, and uh, we will need, of course, a lot of training. This is very important, training everywhere uh, in corporates, uh, uh, in financials. Um, and uh, we will need also to, to make sure that uh, the, this new integration of an externality, uh, CO2, is well managed uh, in corporates. So uh, there you have a set of questions such as remuneration uh, package and structure, uh, involvement of uh, boards, of executive uh, committees, but also uh, uh, pay structure of uh, bankers, of managers. I mean, it has to be to go deep into uh, corporates and financial. It's not only an issue of uh, general management, of course, and boards. And, um, we, of course, recognize that we have to come very quick on uh, a strategy to get out of fossil fuels uh, by 25, 2030, 2050. And, um, and again, all this uh, will, be, uh, will be done uh, if we succeed in organizing um, a co-construction and co-management system uh, among these three pillars, corporate, financials, and uh, authorities. Authorities in, in a very broad sense. Many thanks, uh, uh, Stanislas. Uh, I don't know whether we have time for more than one question, but at least we can take one. So first of all, thanks a lot, Stanislas, for being here. And, and thanks for a comprehensive report. I, I, I must say I was impressed because it's 100 pages, very comprehensive. and. Uh, I think it's just like a lecture, so for those teaching, you have everything on the European regulation, very well explained, so I really encourage you to, to read it. Now, I have a question because you're a bit silent in the report on, on the amount of risk that uh, we will need to take, and you mentioned that here in your talk, the fact that we, we're going, we, we need, northern countries need to finance projects in the south, plus climate risk is an additional source of risk for investors, so how are you going to organize that? Because and investors and clients, uh, I'm thinking about pension fund beneficiaries, mm. retail clients, they are maybe not able to take that amount of risk. So that will probably necessitate also, you know, new hedging strategies, uh, guarantees. So how would you see no, that? It's a bit in the report. Thank you for the, for, for, for the question. Um, I would say that uh, twofold answers. Um, first, uh, we must build uh, data to, to uh, really assess uh, the risk more precisely. So, if we, and we must know uh, where corporate stands and portfolio stands, carbon-wise and transition-wise. That's also why we, we propose a new uh, label on climate transition, specific, uh, specific to climate transition, because we do not have uh, frameworks of assessment on, on transition. Again, we have a lot of them 
on environment, on climate, but not the process of transition. So if we uh, are clear on uh, the, the, the carbon emission structure and uh, the ability to, uh, to, to transform, uh, of course, we'll be able to assess more precisely risk. And then uh, it's part of the financial innovation we will have to do with uh, governments. We will most probably have to mitigate risk. So there is a question of allocation of resources. So where do uh, we put this risk with these resources with the right cost of capital or cost of financing? Uh, I've heard uh, uh, in, in, the pre in the previous uh, roundtable uh, all the work uh, which has been done. But um, for certain uh, um, part of the resources, uh, for certain uh, uh, owners, we will uh, will have to, to protect the security uh, they want to, to preserve for their uh, portfolios, their investments. And this will be done with, the, for instance, international financial institutions uh, or uh, governments or regional, uh, regional uh, public authorities. But uh, we've been able to do that. I, I don't want to, to advertise uh, Amundi uh, products. Uh, that's not the issue there. But we've been able to build some products with the IFC World Bank, with the IEB, and with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank so that we mitigate risk in a, in a, in a way and give more access to this green finance uh, to projects or institutions that we are not able to, to access to this, uh, to this. So this is possible. Uh, of course, we have to put it at scale. Uh, so this is quite an issue, but... Thank you very much. So thanks a lot. I think we need to move forward because we're a bit late. So th thanks a lot, Stanislas. Thank and you. thanks a lot, Jean, for sharing this session. And we now have the prize, right? So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, now it's time to celebrate a little bit. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, researchers and professionals, uh, participants online and participants in the room, together with uh, Zeyn, we are extremely pleased to be here today in the name of the uh, IEF and uh, SCORE Foundation for Science Award. We are happy to announce uh, in a few minutes the seventh winner of the best young researcher in finance and insurance. So we will keep the suspense a little bit for a minute more, just to remind us why we in the uh, Institut Louis Bachelier group since 2016, we have been invested in this collaboration with the SCORE Foundation of Science. At CLB, our raison d'être is to develop and promote research that supports sustainable development in finance and insurance. And to be able to do that, we need excellent and dedicated researcher. The IF Score Foundation for Science Award, the best young researcher in finance and insurance, helps to identify and support the new generation of excellent researchers. The award supports a promising young man or woman working to contribute uh, to sustainable solutions by doing research that will help us understand or act. For these two reasons alone, the award is very important. So I thank the SCORE Foundation for Science for our lasting collaboration. And I wish to thank all of you present for the work you are doing in the name of scientific progress. And now the award winner. So the best young researcher 2022 is already quite excellent and he leaves promise of more to come. The award winner has proven, like the best young researchers of the previous years, a very high level of research, and he was elected, so you know already that it's a man, he was elected with a significant majority of votes. He has been published in highly esteemed journals, such as Journal of Finance, Review of Financial Studies, and Review of Financial and Management Science, and he has also international recognition among peers. His research focuses on the regulation of banks and securities markets. In his articles, he studies theoretically or empirically various market failures, discuss regulatory proposals, and warn against their possible perverse effect or proposes 
uh, alternative solution. He has studied topics such as the taxation of financial transactions, the regulation of trading fees set by the stock exchanges, the calculation of regular capital for banks, the single European supervisory mechanism of the regulation of systemic risk. We at the Louis Bachelet Group are proud to announce with the SCORE Foundation for Science that the 2022 Best Young Researcher in Finance and Insurance is awarded to Mr. Jean-Edouard Colliard from HEC. Please come up here. Do join us. So congratulations, Jean Edouard. As we just heard in the presentation from Stanislas Potier, Paris and France has the potential to take the position as a leading player when it comes to one of them, the green transition. Because there is an ecosystem of third class actors here, because the density of researcher is high, and because we work together to find solutions. This capacity is not only true for the green transition. At the Institut Louis Bachelier and the two foundations, IF and Fondation du Risque, we also host an equal capital of excellent representatives from regulative, academics, and private levels when it comes to the digital, demographic, and financial transitions. They work all together to produce sustainable progress through our more than 70 current programs uh, at Institut Louis Bachelier. So you are one of the researchers who takes part. jean Edouard has been part of the Louis Bachelier network since his early career and was already recognized by the Louis Bachelier group in 2015 when he was selected for an IEF grant. So we are very pleased to see this young researcher be acknowledged not only by us, but also by our partners and the surrounding academic ecosystem. So congratulations again, jean Edouard, and then I'll leave you the floor. Thank you, Didier, for the word. So thank you, Institute the Louis Bachelier, for this uh, valuable collaboration. Thank you, researchers and uh, practitioners of the Risks Forum 2022 for being here. But most of all, thank you, Mr. Goliard, for being an excellent researcher. I'm honored to, to be here today and in name of the Institute of the Plus of the Finance, Scar Foundation for Science Award, co announce the seventh winner of Best Young Researcher in Finance and Insurance. A big congratulations to you, Mr. <coughs> Goliath, for bringing it home. So the Risks Forum is the exact and the obvious place to give this award because of the Financial Risks International Forum is a conference that brings together many of such excellent men. I wish to thank IEF and the Institute Louis Bachelier for collaboration. And, <coughs> and I wish to thank you, all of you present here, for the work you are doing in the name of scientific progress. The mission of the Scott Foundation for Science is to support excellence in scientific research. The prize awarded to Mr. Goliath <coughs> do exactly that. Mr. Goliath has proven through his publish, publications and his international recognition among peers that he is a researcher we should pay attention to when thinking solutions for financial issues of today and tomorrow. Mr. Colliard is Associate Professor of Finance at HSC Paris and the co-holder of the Analytics for Future Banking Research Chair. The main fears of uh, Mr. Colliard are regulation of financial institutions and the market microstructure, a new area of research. In this paper, Measuring Regulatory Complexity, he discusses regulatory proposals and warns against their possible inefficiencies if not well designed. The main interest of his research, from our point of view, is that regulation should take care to give 
the right incentive to the supervised companies and pay a lot of attention to the conditions under which it is efficient. With the Skull Foundation and the Institute Louis Bachelier with the IEF are proud to give Mr. Goliath this 2022 award. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a great honor, a great, great pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your kind words. It's, uh, it's too much, really. <laughs> it's a lot, lot about myself. Um, I was asked to, to, to give a, a, short, um, a short speech. I know those speeches are usually too long, so I'll keep it very short. Um, I'm, of course, very grateful for this prize. I mean, I, I, if I look at the list of past laureates, you know, it's really a list of of excellent researchers, so I think the jury has a, has a very good taste, at least in previous years, you know, so hopefully uh, this year too, and you know, most of the past laureates are, are friends and, and even colleagues, so I'm, I'm very, very flattered. Um, so yeah, again, I know from experience that you know, these speeches are easily uh, uh, too long, I'll keep mine short. So very quickly, what is my research about? Well, a lot has been said already, and, and you summarized it uh, very well. So, well, this has been mentioned, but so I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed to confess I'm, uh, I do mostly uh, microeconomic theory. I guess I'm probably one of the few uh, microeconomic theorists in the, in, the, in the room, but I apply it to banking and financial markets, and so that, that makes it more interesting, probably. And so in particular, I, I apply it to issues of um, financial regulation. And so why do I think it's a relevant and interesting thing to do, you know, in, in my research, but also for, you know, many of my uh, colleagues and fellow academics who work on, on similar topics? So if you think about you know, financial markets today, well, there's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of new data, a lot of new markets, a lot of new phenomena, a lot of new market infrastructures, a lot of new participants, a lot of new demands by, by investors. So a lot of things happen in finance all the time. And if you work with data, which I you know, do also you know, from time to time, it's clear that data alone is not sufficient to understand all that is happening and so because the world is so complex and is moving so fast that we need models and, and conceptual frameworks to simplify you know what's going on and help us you know uh, uh, think in, in simple terms and so that's really the job of, uh, of theorists like me to, to provide these models. So just to give you an example so last year I, I published two papers on over-the-counter markets and so over-the-counter markets are a growing uh, research area in, in academia and so I mean they, they have a very old history so it's about time we we look at them, um, but you know, these are markets that are very, very uh, confusing because when you look at the data, there are many transactions happening at many different prices between many different market participants that are extremely heterogeneous. And so if you ask even very simple questions like, has the market become you know, more liquid or less liquid after the crisis? Uh, do uh, you know, small investors uh, get better conditions than before? Are there questions of risk among uh, dealers and things like that. It's extremely complicated actually to answer uh, these questions. And so we need, you know, really models to, uh, to think about how these markets work, what are the different uh, risks, how we measure liquidity, um, how do we take into account the heterogeneity of participants and so on and so on. Okay? And so in this whole field, actually theory and, and empirics have, have grown uh, together, have made progress and in hand in the past, you know, 10 years or so. Um, and, and actually more and more papers combine theory and empirics into structural models, and so that's really where the frontier is at the moment. Another reason why we need theory, and so a lot of my research has been in this, uh, in this area, is, is to guide policy. Okay? So I've worked, for instance, as was mentioned uh, very nicely, uh, the, on the design of bank supervision in the euro area, so on the uh, single supervision mechanism. And I think, you know, for big regulatory reforms, so very often, unfortunately, you know, we don't have time to experiment, to test on a small scale, you know, sometimes it's just not possible. So you need to get it right, you know, from the start. And, and for this, you need to have a clear theoretical understanding uh, ex ante, and that's where you need, uh, you know, a good uh, economic theory to help guide um, decisions, okay? And so, well, sometimes we are listened to, sometimes not, but I think it's always useful to have some theory before taking this uh, these regulatory decisions. And finally, since the topic of, of the conference is, is green transition, so I don't work on this uh, myself, but I just wanted to mention, you know, to give you an idea of, of exciting research that is going on at the moment 
uh, in, in, in theory. Um, and so some of the questions you know, that other theories are trying to answer at the moment. So these are questions like, can you channel more bank funding towards climate transition using, for instance, green risk weights? Okay, is that a good idea? Uh, is that going to work? What are the costs of doing this? Maybe there are hidden costs of doing this. Maybe it's not such a good idea. Uh, can ESG funds engage with uh, polluting companies and make them change their policy? Okay? Does that work or is that an illusion? What are the conditions? What are maybe the best targets you know, for uh, ESG funds that want to have this type of strategy? What is the cost also for ESG investors? You know, can you do that at no cost or are investors need to be, maybe they need to be ready to concede you know, and, and get uh, lower returns? So all these questions are being you know, analyzed right now. And there's a lot of exciting research uh, going on on the, on the theory front, also on the empirical front. And so, you know, I think what this is illustrating is that financial markets, they are an endless source of new, exciting research questions. And all of them are opportunities for academics uh, like me to, you know, to exercise our brains, to give new knowledge to our students, and sometimes, you know, to have novel things to say to, to the industry and to regulatory authorities and be part of, of important debates. Uh, about what, what's going on in, in finance, okay? And so, thanks a lot, thank you very much. It's, it's really, again, you know, a great honor to receive this prize. Thanks a lot to the, the SCORE Foundation and to the, the IEF, and thanks a lot, everybody, and enjoy, enjoy the conference. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot and congratulations Jean, Jean Edouard for the prize. So we are going to, because we're late, so we're going to uh, move everything from uh, 15 minutes so you have a break, <laughs> you can now enjoy a coffee and we're going to start again at uh, 11.30. Thank you very much. Merci. Ben bon, merci à vous.